Well, greetings, everyone, and soon to be season's greetings, as this will be the final monthly video of 2023. As you can see, we are currently experiencing a cold spell across Europe. And since our landlord, as per government regulations, just installed a heat pump in the office, now even inside the building is freezing. But before any of you send in Christmas gifts of woolly jumpers, or even something alcoholic to warm the cockles, never fear that the Argonaut Corporate Gifts Department has swung into action, producing some splendid winter hats in the Argonaut team colours. I think you would agree that only a Christmas Grinch would deny that these hats would make a fine and indeed generous Christmas gift or even bonus for every member of staff. We have also a limited number available to our unit holders. A Merry Christmas to you all. During the month, the 10-year US Treasury yield, having briefly touched 5% in October for the first time since 2007, fell to 4.32% at the end of the month. This came after the Federal Reserve noted that the previous steepening of the yield curve had already tightened financial conditions and that this might preclude the need to raise Fed funds further. Fed officials are yet to offer an opinion on whether November's loosening of financial conditions now requires them to reconsider. So bonds were down in yield but up in price, and continuing the high correlation of late, equity markets were also up strongly, 6% in sterling terms. The fund was up over 2%. However, the easing of financial conditions saw dead cats bounce, with five trading days of short squeezes, which the fund mitigated through a prudent reduction in its gross exposure. The fund made more than 4% in its long book, but lost 2% from its short book. For more details, please refer to our monthly fact sheet. Let me take you back three years to November 2020, which witnessed the announcement of the trial results from the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, which saw headlines of 90% and 95% efficacy, respectively. Well, after three years, it's time to reassess the efficacy of these claims. We published several blogs in the summer of 2020, notably Great Expectations for Vaccines Threaten More Hard Times, and Dud COVID Vaccines Are No Silver Bullets, suggesting that COVID vaccines would be no more effective than other coronavirus vaccines, notably flu vaccines, and that they would not stop the transmission of the virus, but might ameliorate symptoms. Now, we didn't think that at the time we were suggesting anything particularly controversial. It was, after all, what the head of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, Sarah Gilbert, was also publicly communicating. But unwittingly, by having an independent view on the main economic issue of the day, we were walking where angels feared to tread. As politicians saw the vaccine as a way out of lockdowns that they had imposed on the whole of the population, rather than just the population that was vulnerable to the onset of the disease. Soon, the media was reporting vaccine efficacy as purporting to the transmission of the virus, a claim that the trials didn't even attempt to measure, and a claim that the vaccine companies were careful not to make for themselves. We noted that the vaccine trials were flawed. Not only did they not seek to measure protection from the transmission of the virus, only the severity of the symptoms from those infected, but that the number of infected patients in the trials were tiny, and that the population samples were subject to data manipulation. For example, deaths in the control group were conveniently not blamed on COVID, while those that were in the placebo group were. Symptoms were only monitored for two months, after which monitoring of patients for an experimental drug was bizarrely discontinued. We also, also thought it strange that Moderna claimed that older patients with less good immune systems responded better to the vaccine, which would be a first, and that Astra claimed to achieve a higher efficacy on a lower dose, also another first. By the time we published a further blog in July 2021, entitled 
what did 90% efficacy actually mean, it was clear that none of the vaccines achieved a lasting immunological benefit for longer than a few weeks and would have to be topped up regularly by boosters. Following the market euphoria at the vaccine headline efficacy, in which the market didn't care to look beyond, we initiated a short in Moderna, which made the then glorious claim to have invented its COVID vaccine over a weekend and suggested that its mRNA technology platform could be used to cure other diseases, notably cancer. This is despite having never demonstrated any sustained immunological benefit for COVID. We were struck not only by how the only medical product the company had ever had approved was its COVID vaccine, a repurposed flu vaccine, but that the company, its technology and its management had until COVID been commonly regarded as poor and somewhat spivvy. Well, three years later, and following 156 weekends during which its scientists invented no useful new products, Moderna's share price is down more than 80%. COVID vaccine sales have plummeted, the virus has morphed into less aggressive variants, the company is burning through its COVID cash windfall, management continue to sell their shares at every opportunity, and there is growing anger at side effects from people who took the vaccine for whom it was only ever going to be the medical equivalent of return-free risk. Our short and our views have been thoroughly vindicated. Why do we bring this up now? Well, given it was a difficult emotive subject, it would have been far more prudent from a career risk perspective to have kept quiet. What we felt strongly as investors, it would have been stupid not to have had a view on the main economic issue of the day, and that there should be a better informed public debate, which would have led to better decision making with less damage to society, the economy and public health. It is the truth, rather than pompous claims to morality, that is always the most important in life as in investing. Well, after wrestling with the tiger of COVID vaccines, debating the usefulness of wind power with wind enthusiasts is like stroking a tame pussycat. November saw the UK government announce that it would be paying £100 plus inflation for wind power at the sixth CFD auction next year. This is twice the cost of gas generation before carbon taxes. At the same time, they outrageously claimed that offshore wind was still the cheapest form of power generation. We've received remarkably little pushback to our research demonstrating that intermittent power is of little value to the electricity grid and that its uselessness increases exponentially at higher market share. But insofar as we get coherent pushback from wind enthusiasts who've actually read our research before having an opinion, it tends to be of two kinds. The first is that man-made man carbon emissions are rising and that this represents an existential threat to mankind. Irrespective of whether this claim is true, investing in something that is useless isn't going to solve the problem. If wind can't replace fossil fuels, then we must continue to use fossil fuels. Therefore, the something must be done objection is what I call a headless chicken argument. Second, that the inability to store intermittent power at scale at a cost which is not financially ruinous will be solved by new breakthroughs in either battery technology or green hydrogen. Now, seasoned observers of this debate will have seen endless sensational stories of overnight technology breakthroughs that somehow always seem to end in failure, never being able to defy the laws of physics and chemistry. We are reminded of the words of Thomas Edison, Mr. Electricity himself, 140 years ago. The storage battery is, in my opinion, a catch penny, a sensation, a mechanism for swindling the public by stock companies. The storage battery is one of those peculiar things which appeals to the imagination. And no more perfect thing could be desired by stock swindlers than that very self same thing. Just as soon as a man gets working on the secondary battery, it brings out his latent capacity for lying. So there we go. 
plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. The market is now expecting five 25 basis point rate cuts next year, with a high probability of the first rate cut in March. We think that this is too aggressive, considering the US economy is currently still booming. For example, revised Q3 GDP in the US re-accelerated to plus 5.2% year on year, which was plus 9% nominal. This is a boom. The fiscal deficit is still forecast to be 7% in 2024 ahead of the election, and Secretary Yellen has also rebuilt firepower within the Treasury General account, so the figure could exceed this. And the main refinancing cliff is also delayed until 2025. Moreover, Fed Chairman Powell has persistently warned about repeating the perceived mistakes of Arthur Burns in the 70s in premature easing into President Nixon's 1972 election, which actually ignores the fact that most of the offending rate cuts were actually made in 1974 and 1975 after Nixon left office in 1974. Nevertheless, this means it's unlikely but not impossible that a benevolent Fed delivers rate cuts without a negative economic event. Another way of looking at this is that before third quartile firms are rescued by rate cuts, there would probably likely have to be some victims amongst fourth quartile companies. Sorry to be the Christmas Grinch, but with the best case scenario for soft landing in 2024, now anticipated by November's rally, we worry that this sets up a disappointing year ahead for equity markets as a whole. We find it difficult to envisage that any further bond market easing will be equity friendly, since it would likely reflect slowing nominal growth that would impact profits. More likely, growth in the US turns out to be surprisingly resilient, and duration, on which recent surveys have shown record bullishness, sells off again. Indeed, we don't rule out a further rate hike from the Fed. Investors continue to ignore the fiscal recklessness of governments running record peacetime deficits at a time of full employment and the need for the ownership of the government debt market to change from public to private, thus crowding out all other asset classes. There is also the prospect in 2024 of the Bank of Japan formally exiting yield curve control and zero interest rates, which would serve to accelerate the repatriation of Japanese capital from elsewhere in the world. All of this requires other assets to be sold to fund government, the beasts that must be fed. Government in the UK currently accounts for nearly half of all economic activity, and this is an unprecedented intervention outside of World War II and COVID. This expansion of the state has occurred without any democratic mandate, and financial markets have been slow to appreciate its consequences. Indeed, we now have the inglorious phenomenon of politicians allocating capital whilst fund managers try to save the environment and solve social inequality. We would surely have a better world for our children, as well as higher returns on capital, if all concern stuck to what the late great Charlie Munger termed their circle of competence. We plan for the worst, but hope for the best. We at Argonaut wish you all a happy Christmas and a prosperous 2024.